Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this What's Left of Philosophy live stream. I'm Owen, one of the co-hosts of the show, along with Gil. Hey, Gil. Hello. It's uh, Lillian. Hey, hey Lillian. And uh, Will. Hey, what's up, y'all? So we're extremely excited today to have a couple special guests in the house to help us untangle the intricacies of the contemporary reactionary mind, or maybe mind in air quotes. Um, so I'll say a bit more about what we'll be addressing together in a minute, but let me just first introduce uh, David Griscom. Uh, David is the co-host of the excellent live show um, and podcast, Left Reckoning. I tune into Left Reckoning as often as I can. I, I love the work that you and Matt Leck uh, do over there providing incisive theory-informed commentary on contemporary politics. Um, and our second guest is Ben Burgess. Ben's a columnist at Jacobin and the host of the show, Give Them an Argument, uh, in which he uses his academic expertise in logic and critical thinking to help fortify the arguments for a host of left positions. So really the Lord's work, and I think we're all better for it. Um, so today, we're going to be discussing what we're calling the contemporary reactionary mind, uh, and especially two of its most prominent voices, Jordan Peterson and James Lindsay, though I'm sure there may be some other figures that enter into the, into the picture. Um, today's reactionaries, I think, share certain things with the reactionary minds of previous generations, especially a virulent anti-communism and anti-socialism. But in my view, they're much more confused than, say, a William F. Buckley or a Friedrich Hayek or even a Carl Schmitt, if we go back further. The left phobia of today's reactionaries is characterized by a really dizzying set of ahistorical conflations and conceptual confusions. <laughs> their, their iteration of anti-totalitarian crusading is a purely idealist culture war against what they call wokeness, a more anodyne-sounding cultural revolution that threatens to dissolve the social bonds, corrode all institutions, and eventually herald a totalitarian dystopia in which corporate DEI initiatives slowly morph into pseudo-Soviet re-education camps. I can't wait, that sounds so cool. <laughs> <laughs> so de deepening the confusion of their social analysis are their bizarre accounts of the history of philosophy in which the Immanuel Kant to wokeness pipeline <laughs> runs through Hegel, Marx, Frankfurt School critical theory, through critical race theory, right up to figures like Robin DiAngelo and Ibram X. Kendi, who are characterized as something called postmodern neo-Marxists. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to when they, they figure it, like they start to, to bring it back be, uh, behind Kant. Oh, like, yeah. Like, we've like, we've like, talked like about that. Plato, Let's go all the way to Heraclitus. Yeah. Like, like, like a man, that fragment, <laughs> yeah. that fragment, that <laughs> fragment, though? <laughs> So, I mean, at the very least, right? My friend Ryan Lake points out, like, it's it's really like it seems like at least Descartes, right? I mean, like, like he's, he's that's saying, an obvious that's radical you know, doubt. I mean, come on, doubt. surely Descartes, you know. I mean, I've heard like, Mark Levin the... go to Plato, right? He he's he says Aristotle's what, the lineage that we should have followed. It, it all went wrong <laughs> with Plato, and and then so people are like, wait, is it Aristotle? Is it Aristotle? Came after like Arist pro slave? Is it the pro slavery in Aristotle? Like, what is <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The guy with the natural slave. Yeah, yeah, that exactly. <laughs> okay, so I, I figured out. I thought I would start. Sorry. I thought we'd just start out maybe by um, helping our listeners to kind of historicize these figures a bit, um, to situate them in a in a lineage of reactionary thinkers. So I guess my question is: is where do they fit? Like, what's particular about our reactionaries today? Our precious reactionaries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, listening to you talk, especially with some of the people that you name, like, look, I'm no fan of, like, William F. Buckley. It gets a little more complicated with my love, hate, of favorite Hayek, but mm -hmm. I found myself thinking, you know, we used to be kings and queens. These are <laughs> not the enemies. These are, this is not the caliber that, you know, was, we had to fight in the past, yet that doesn't stop them from being wildly successful. So I think mm -hmm. one key thing, if you want to look at someone like Hayek, is, you know, Hayek did think he was fighting a war not over culture, but over how we understand economic organization. Mm -hmm. And he thought that was, a, that was explicitly vital. So when, with Hayek's anti-communism, anti-socialism, it certainly wasn't, you know, primarily about identity. It was because he thought 
the sources of power about how we you know, um, regulate you know, exchange and production. And that's where we need to go. Here, it's like, they, they explicitly talk about the economy is in a place with this amorphous thing called power and yeah. identity. And so it's like tailor-made, honestly, for an era of internet and Twitter and you know, um, 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 epistemic uh, siloing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, do you think do you think some of that just like we have a worse right now because we have worse left? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, that's <laughs> probably that's <laughs> got to be shit. Look, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hate like, to see it. <laughs> I, I, I think though that like I mean, Peterson is an interesting character, and I think we'll get more to him in in a moment. But I think especially understanding James Lindsay, and and I'll be frank, like. Um, I'm not, you know, shaking my boots about James Lindsay, but I think that he does sort of represent a kind of like frightening shift um, within like, you know, the, the right movement. I mean, because this is somebody who is explicitly calling for, you know, the jailing of socialists and things like yeah. that. I don't think he has the social base or political power to be anywhere near that. But like, it is a very different kind of category, I would I would argue. But beyond all of that, I think to understand James Lindsay, you really have to understand the fact that he came out of the new atheist movement more so in the fact that he wanted to be like hanging out with Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and all those guys but he was too late um, and as my co-host Matt Lex says all the time it's like well the only thing that was left was sort of like social reaction and that's a much less um, you know prestigious intellectually um, thing to get into but it's very very popular online and that's why you see the vast majority of stuff that James Lindsay does at least um, now is he's not really engaging in any kind of serious <laughs> debates with folks because he gets schooled pretty quickly. Um, it's a lot of kind of, you know, Twitter dunking um, yeah. and, you know, encouraging of like hyper reactionaries like Jack Posobiec. You know? yeah. yeah, what's one yeah. of the weird thing. Yeah. One of the strange things is the the kind of on the one hand, like it is meaningless, nothing. It's just pure culture war idealist dunking. And at the same time, like this has gotten it's it's sort of claws into a larger segment of the population than I think we should be mm. at all comfortable with. Uh, evidence for which, if you're at all interested, like go watch videos of like school board meetings where like anti-vax and anti-CRT like talking points are coming up like all the time from parents who are like seemingly totally convinced that like in fact part of the 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 current program is to like indoctrinate and destroy their children in the name of who knows fucking what uh well this is a, G- yeah james Lindsay's mission is to equip parents right he has this mm. anecdote um well his mission at least right now right he has this anecdote about being at a talk and one of the people one of the he said this woman in the audience put her hand up and said listen i don't want to learn about all this hegelian alphabong and all this stuff like i just know in my gut that you know this crt stuff is evil and wrong like i don't want to read all these books like i i get it already you know and he goes imagine you're in london and the nazis are bombing london and you're like you know i don't want to know anything about planes or anti aircraft guns or how to fight how to how to fight the planes that are bombing london and so to give you a sense of like what how he at least perceives his mission and I think to some extent, again, I think you're right, David, that you know we shouldn't shake in our boots about it, but to some extent, there is now you see a kind of penetration into um, a larger set of social institutions than just than just the Twitter sphere. But that's the set, that's at least the self-conception, right? Or the self-perception mm-hmm. of what they're up to. Yeah, I mean, I, w- I would say that, I mean, I'm not shaking my boots, and unlike David, I don't even own any boots, but, uh, but I think that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, oh yeah, David's a Texan. Except right? for snow boots, am I right, Ben? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have certainly owned some of those in my life, but uh, but yeah, I I, I think that uh, but in some ways, like as as easy it is as it is to laugh at Lindsay, and as much as I do encourage people to do that, uh, I I also think like in some ways he is actually objectively more dangerous uh, than um, than some of these other figures have mm-hmm. have been because you know even though David's certainly right that he doesn't have the power to like put anybody in jail like he'd like to. Uh, he certainly has the power to uh, effectively lobby Republican state legislatures yeah. to pass laws mm-hmm. and get people fired from their jobs. And, and he's actually doing that, right? Like, and, and in some ways, I mean, William F. Buckley was invoked a couple times earlier. Mm-hmm. And even though, you know, I mean, look, William F. Buckley was like 10,000 times smarter than James Lindsay, but uh, in a weird way, it's a return to form. Like a couple of years ago, 
I read Buckley's book, uh, God and Man at Yale. And in that book, it's like explicitly like a pro censorship book, right? Like, like, like it's, it's his point is that like too many like socialists and atheists are teaching at Yale and they should fire them all. Like that's, that's basically the thesis of the book. And there's a long time, like there's this long journey where the right was pretending that that wasn't their perspective, that they were all about free speech. And like, that feels like pretty recent. And some of them are still even talking that way. And like, it seems like what Lindsay represents now, among other things, is just explicitly going back to it. It's like, no, we actually don't like free speech. We want to fire mm -hmm. all these people. Yeah, one really of the, yeah, 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 go, go ahead, ahead. I was just gonna say, that's really interesting. You know, the, the idea that, you know, uh, James Lindsay is, you know, a symptom or maybe a harbinger of the right deciding actually all of that commitment to free speech, you know, what did that get us? Let's actually go with what would really work, which is let's just control these institutions. And I think you know, you're right. That doesn't augur well for the near to midterm future, <laughs> increasingly having a political constellation that you know, by creeps or leaps and bounds, however you wanna uh, analyze it, is saying actually those values, we're not committed to it, but we're gonna start to try to supply you with nonsense reasons about why you shouldn't be committed to them either. And mm -hmm. so the, you know, the, what I actually find you know, disconcerting about the new, look, I love laughing at them. I love laughing at that video of James Lindsay with the samurai sword. Which by that the way, we are life. going to laugh at them more in this video. We're going <laughs> yeah, you to. Yeah, you have some lined up for, you, for us. We've got yeah. a bunch lined up, but. But my worry is, you know, um, and Gil was kind of pointing to this, how slowly but surely is even changing the way those who aren't explicitly aligned with them talk about these issues. The, the implicit frame that they bring to them and, you know, the, the concerns that get foregrounded and how they get foregrounded, whether it's something like, you know, cancel culture or for me, it, it sometimes strikes me how much sometimes when I'm like, you know, on the internet that people are still obsessed with Ibram Kendi. And like, I, I get maybe what's going on there, but I'm like, if you're a part of the materialist left, there's no way you think this one dude is the thing wrecking left organization. And like, I dead ass <laughs> never listened to Ibram X. Kendi, like ever. So I, I just like, imagine like letting him live in your mind. Like, like that's a weird obsession to have. Like I've never read Robin D'Angelo's book. I've never watched her talk. Likewise yeah, with the Yeah, we can tell. We can tell, Lillian. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I have other, You're way I have too materialist to have ready. You need to brush up on your Marxism, Lillian. <laughs> I mean, yeah. actually, this is like my thing is, I actually do think that part of all of this is like a little sad. Like when I'm not laughing at it, like, okay, so I had this experience where I was kind of preparing for this and I listened to this interview with James Lindsay and I thought it was going to be funny, but it like, wasn't funny. I was like by myself cooking in my kitchen and it, I just started feeling like really like anxious because the whole thing is like kind of pathetic in this way that makes me reflect on like how my side must also be pathetic. If this is like what I'm dealing with. I mean, he's it's such a little, he's this. such a little snowflake. He's like, oh my God, you know, you're in classrooms and people are encountering liberals. Like what a, what a scary thing for our youth. And it's just like wild. I'm like the fact that they're like, oh, well the terrain shifts from economics to culture. I'm like, and then the people who are apparently we're supposed to expect to like guard against these mm -hmm. like challenges to free speech or like academics basically like we're all gonna like upscale this to the level of the university i'm like yeah because this is like where politics is is right right now this is what they feel like they have to like pay attention to and that's just kind of it's like sad for all of us you know no, like there's sure. when you yeah. don't have any like like <clears throat> i think what makes previous generations of conservatives different is they had like a bona fide opponent and they had to worry about that like someone like Hayek is different because he's arguing with people like Neurat and um yeah. uh, like and what I forget his last name is it his first name Oscar Langa you know like people who are like we're gonna bu we're building socialism in Europe period and then and then Hayek has to be like no you're not and you shouldn't because that's irrational and he has to like go back and forth mm. like that now we're just like talking about what in classrooms of basically 18 and 19 year olds we should be 
talking about like it's bizarre you know what i mean okay like, no totally like like this yeah i mean it, and this is what i was saying about i think they're you know the right is worse because the left is worse because they because you know yes yeah, not responding to auto direct who's responding to uh ibram x candy right like that's uh <laughs> you know it's like the you know the left at this time was you know having debates about how socialism could work because they thought they were going to win mm -hmm. and like they what people like Lindsay think is the left and equate with the left is completely idealist and you know and, and, and it's it's all it really is all about culture uh and um and even like a lot of the actual left you know either sort of tails that in a weird way or it has a uh or it's it's like you know engaged in these weird like you know like instead of like thinking about how socialism would work right like Norrath and Longa were right you know like people are thinking about like I don't know was like what was the symbolism of AOC wearing the tax the rich dress to the you know to the Met Gala so, you know? so close to waiting we can solve that one <laughs> that's the only thing holding us back yeah no no I mean it, exactly so it's like they yeah I mean of course their their opponents are worse you know and, and also like they've just been winning in a lot more ways <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so much yeah. <laughs> after they like so thir 35 years yeah 35 odd years of just like getting their policies enacted time and again like what is there left to like well, I guess winning, that's why well, they, winning does to your intellectual project it maybe. hurts it's no good <laughs> i guess that's why they, they have the luxury of like inventing their opponent right i guess that goes to some mm -hmm. of the, the confusion that they have about who mm. who their opponent is and how they are able to like fold marxism into you know, into postmodernism and talk about people like Jacques Derrida as like, you know, the preeminent Marxists of the seventies, like French scene <laughs> is that, well, there isn't a pronounced enough threatening enough left to actually fight with. And so like, we'll take this liberal, like a cultural politics and mix it, the vocabulary in with a bunch of Marxism and a bunch of, you know, uh, previous left d uh, discourse and then attack that. Right. It's, yeah, it's as though to like, a, a, I think it was Andrew Breitbart who said that politics is downstream from culture, right? And like, they've all bought this. And I think to your point, Ben, like a lot of folks on the, like the progressive side of things seem to have bought this too. Totally. Mm -hmm. This is infuriating, yeah. right? Because this is, I mean, you couldn't have a better maxim for like an idealist theory of history uh, and society. <laughs> like that's, that's getting everything completely the wrong way around. But then, you know, when these arguments are happening, uh, happening on the terrain of culture, the other like way I was thinking about this lately is like seeing all of, someone just posted in our in our shared group chat um, a news item about like books being banned from being taught in schools as basically a result of this kind of reactionary agitation on the part of our our Lindsay's and Rufo's pin and Rufo. I want to talk about his evil ass in a minute. Um, but uh, um, there's almost like a a like in order for this to be the policies that they want and for them to agitate in the way that they do, they have to have like this like mystical, like like this belief in like this mystical power of ideas, right? This like mm. way in which in order for this to be as, as terrifying as it is apparently to them, or at least in as much as they say what they actually think, uh, you know, you have to make sure that students in, in classrooms are never even exposed to ideas. Because if they are, if, if, what happens if you're like a parent and your kid comes home and is like, hey, I like heard that slavery was bad. And you're like, no, <laughs> I can't, we're like, I can't. Why have you dissolved we, the, we can't the un, normal we can't family? Un, we can't undo this indoctrination now. They're too far. Like, what the fuck are you talking mm -hmm. about? Like, students don't even listen to their teachers 90% of the fucking time. Like, what is... You know what I mean? Like what, which, what are the, is, what are the yeah, which is also here? the thing, like even if even if critical race theory literally were being taught right. in, in, in high schools. Right. I mean, like 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 which, you know, like I'm sure that like there are cases where like social justice -y stuff that's kind of cringy and weird does make it into, you know, some high school, whatever. But occasionally, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. Depending on the district or whatever. Right. You know, but like. Uh, but like, even if literally like, like Kimberly Crenshaw, and Derek Bell were like routinely being assigned <laughs> to high school classes. Okay. Yeah. I, I, like mm -hmm. why, why, why would you care about that? Like that does that doesn't actually impact, like, 
like, I mean, I, look, I disagree with some of that because I, you know, I agree with like the stuff that like Trey Reed and people like that would say about it, but whatever, it wouldn't be on like the top 50 list of things that were taught in high schools <laughs> that I disagreed with, you know, and I certainly don't see how they think that adversely affects anything larger that they care about. Yeah. Or again, or like, even, have you ever, yeah, sorry, go ahead, James. No, I was just going to say like, you know, someone who's like educated in the South with some really great teachers and some hyper reactionary ones. Um, like the the text that you're reading or what we're being what is being brought up does not necessarily mean that the conversations are going to be very progressive. Right? I'm just saying, like I remember some really horrible conversations that were had in high school. You know, reading you know somewhat progressive you know text or you know exposing like the history of racism. And then you know yeah. people like ideology is strong, right? If people have been taught to think a certain way, they're going they they built up the strength to basically be hateful, um, despite you know what what is brought up to them. But like Lindsay's thing is it's not just schools, right? I mean he's somebody again this like new new atheist character right who was getting worked up the other day um, about the southern baptist convention and for people who aren't familiar you know with the southern baptist right you know that is a a, a bit of, of baptism in america that split from the national baptist movement in this country over the question of slavery right and james lindsay is now saying that the sbc is now becoming woke and it has been infiltrated by like woke ideology the the the, the, the content of those charges um is completely ethereal right um but it's it's just it, he's found a way to sort of point to this boogeyman everywhere and there's never really much um no content to it um and and, and and he does it in ways that just are completely absurd because i'm going to tell you right now um <laughs> the southern baptist convention is not some kind of radical progressive organization <laughs> in the year 2021 it might be a little bit nicer than it was 15 years ago but i'm gonna tell you right now this is not you know the cutting edge of progressive politics my um, mom lives in atlanta and i definitely know some of the southern baptists so as soon as you said that i was like the, the southern baptist convention <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, that does say something about how far the culture war has shifted since the mm -hmm. era when, you know, new atheism, I mean, it never made sense. It was always <laughs> kind of ridiculous and idealist, but like, you know, since it like fit the culture war in the way that it did in like 2009, mm -hmm. uh, like how far things have shifted because like, look, I mean, if, if James Lindsay had actually been hanging out with, you know, whatever, Richard Dawkins and whoever in 2009, like that would be kind of the opposite of what their criticism of the Southern Baptist would have been mm. at that time. Yeah. Right? You know? exactly. Interesting, yeah. yeah. No, I, what I, do you all? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead, Will. Yeah. I was just going to ask a question because, like, you know, sometimes you. I, I mean, yes, I know, like, you know, the immediate things to worry about with this you know, type of thinking, is like your know, your know, book bannings and getting people fired. But you, know, I think you. Know, there is a type of left that's just like these people are obviously clowns. There's no reason to pay attention to what this what is going on here. And I wonder if there's a question to ask. You know, what effect this type of culture war and discourse can have on practical politics? And so let me say, like, one of the first things that comes to my mind, like, you know, what, you know, when you're looking at school boards and all of that, this can turn into at, at least you know um, seeds of a type of political organizing where you know, people are um, learning how to work together to achieve aims. We might not like the aims that they're achieving, but you know, I wonder if it's too quick to say, you know, this is just like a sort of clown character and you know, will have no sort of material effect on our society where you know, schools are you know, a really powerful locus of, you know, if we're talking about grassroots organizing of day-to-day -day life, you know, what is happening there. And so sometimes, you know, I, I wonder if this can start to affect different political constellations of, of organizing. Not, I mean, not to, not to mention, just really quickly, like just to, just to pile on to uh, William's point, like public schools are also one of the like last great bastions of unionization in the United mm. States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to ask actually dovetailing with that question, like where I still want to better situate like where these figures and what they what these ideological programs are doing in a larger kind of materialist mm -hmm. understanding of our contemporary conjuncture, right? It's clear to me where what something or what a figure like Hayek is doing at the time of his <laughs> writing, which is like being the kind of ideological wing of a so a concrete social and economic struggle that was like global in scope. Now, assuming that figures like Jordan Peterson or James Lindsay are not just like cultural aberrations or just pure, um, you know, th that we can't situate them, so, or sorry, assuming that we can situate them, 
where do these efforts, like even as far as like school boards go, like what are, what are they, where do they, where do they fit in the field of force relations that exists right now on the kind of social and political plane? You see what I'm saying? And, and the economic plane too. Like what is the class function of figures like this? Like I genuinely find it somewhat <laughs> confusing, right? I get the class function of previous forms of, the previous like fascistic ideologies in which it's an anti-communism that bourgeois, you know, that the bourgeoisie can ally with um, in their attempts to suppress the left. But the left doesn't, like we've said over and over again here, the left doesn't really exist in the same way that it did when Schmidt was writing or when Hayek was writing. So like, I, I don't know, do you see what I'm trying to ask? Like, I, I'm it trying to figure out where, where, does, where do these the efforts way. fit? It doesn't even exist in the same way it did in the 80s or 90s. Like when you listen to people like right-wing radio, people who like, um, you know, you can tell, so for example, the Chicago teachers voted not to go back to school. Right-wing media right now is like, like people who are like in their fifties, they were like, that's us. Yes, we're in. Go, like, this is our segment today. We are on it. We are on the unions. Like we are going to slam these people. They don't want to go to work, you know, and everything else. And you can tell that that's what they're comfortable with. And like, um, this other like, and then like, they kind of hear about, and then they need like, I don't know, people like, like James Lindsay comes in and he's like, I'm like from behind enemy lines and I'm going to like tell you what's been going on behind the scenes. And even people from the eighties and nineties are like, whoa, crazy that this neo Marxist plot is going on out there. But of course <laughs> that's where it all comes from, you know? So there's actually like this kind of, I, that's all just like back up Owen's question. Like what is the base of this kind of thing? And like, what is creating the peel of this particular way of our articulating like these I I ideas because even like 30 years ago that wasn't like he he's telling them that like this is what's invading your schools and they're like holy shit we have to stop it uh, I, I i mean I, I think to understand you have to like look at like the state of politics in in, in this country and i think um and, and specifically what the right wing has been doing mm -hmm. over the past few years right um, and I think Texas is a very good example of this where, you know, you see this kind of triumphant discourse that has been, you know, dominating a lot of like, you know, liberal media for, for a while that like Texas is going to turn blue because there's so many Hispanic people here now and so many people of color, right? It's just going to magically transform the politics of the state. Turned out to not be true at all. Um, in, in 2020, in, in a very frightening way, Donald Trump actually was able to make massive inroads yep. um, with those with those populations. And, you know, the reasons for it are, are you know, pretty mixed, and I don't want to just, you know, overdetermine something. But one thing that is very, very, has been very, very influential, especially with like the Tejano population, has been this kind of cultural pushback against, you know, like woke discourse. And you're seeing it not just necessarily on the national or sorry, the state being too much of a Texas nationalist, but, uh, you know, just like on the state yeah. level, right? <laughs> on, on the state level, right? I'm not even just talking about people running for, you know, state office, but you're seeing this kind of uptick in people running for school boards, right? Who might not come from the kind of demographic you might expect a, you know, anti, you know, woke um, person to sort of, you know, where you expect them to sort of come from. Um, and I think that this has been a very, very like, it's been very fruitful um, space for like the right wing to sort of make inroads in in, in popu populations that like, you know, socialist politics or like even just like a kind of basic social democratic labor politics should be able to make in those communities. But because they've the Democratic Party nationally and definitely state uh, in, the, in the state of Texas has completely run away from any kind of, you know, like economic uh, populism, you know, policies and instead are so fixated on doing this kind of, you know, like upper middle class suburban strategy, you know, the people who are very upset about Trump's language and all that kind of stuff. That's been their move because they've sort of expected that, you know, people of color and, and Tejanos are just going to stick with them forever. Um, and the right wing has been very effective at seeing this as, as an opening, right? And this is, you know, this has generated a few people who are running in this cycle. Um, this has generated people who are running, um, you know, pro cop campaigns in, uh, in cities across Texas. Um, you know, like this has been a very great way to sort of recruit folks. And again, like we can talk about how, you know, slippery, like the actual ideology and points that James Lindsay and Jordan Peterson even are, are, are making. Um, but at a certain point, it's, I feel like a lot of people, the reason that I get really worried too about the school board stuff um, and the school thing is like, as Ben was saying, one, yeah, it's a, you know, hotbed of unionization, um, but also 
you know, as somebody who really does believe in like democracy as a concept, or at least in like the public ownership of things, I do find it very worrying that a lot of people do see, feel like this kind of separation between themselves as citizens of this country and like the school system, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people, this is why there's such uproar about it, is they feel like it's something that's being put on them, pushed on them from above, instead of something that, you know, flows out of, out of the community, right? Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of real reasons that people have that kind of alienation from you know public goods um and i think it's worrying uh, that you know the left isn't really there to con you know to stand up in that space and it's the right now pushing these kind of really you know wild you know conspiracy theories about how we're all learning about you know lenin and uh you know, critical race theories in schools and um you know across across the country yeah i, I mean i think that the uh, i mean to what you're talking about to uh, you know broaden it beyond texas if that's okay uh, i think uh <laughs> you know i think the the like election you know in, in, in virginia you know the, uh, mm -hmm. the last year is is a perfect example because uh, they managed, you know, I mean, the, the Republicans successfully, you know, managed to rile people up with bullshit about critical race theory. But uh, but I think if, if you look at the, you know, Democratic response, right, I mean, like the, um, you know, the response, you know, from like Terry McAuliffe certainly wasn't to say, like, just the obvious things you think you'd say, like, mm -hmm. why are we talking about this? This mm -hmm. is stupid, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. It sounds like this guy wants to, you know, maybe you should run for school board. I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Right. Like, like, let's, you know, I want to talk about like wages and, you know, jobs and stuff like that. Right. Like he, he didn't do that. Right. I mean, it's, instead he just like leaned really, really hard into being mm -hmm. anti, anti CRT. And, uh, you know, we kind of, you know, we oh, kind of so saw really it. Funny. Terry McCulloch was not the spokesperson to even want for that hypothetical position. No, I, 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 mean, he, I, mean, I mean, there's a reason he didn't do that, right? Like uh, uh, that, uh, that he he wouldn't have been able to pull it off because he doesn't actually believe the things he'd have to believe, you know, to mm -hmm. to, to you know to say that, right? But I mean, it is really revealing, and and I mean, I do want to. I don't want to let this detract from like making fun of Jordan Peterson, James Lindsay, because I'm super duper here for that. I, I, yeah. I want to, I want to do that soon. But like, I, I think that, I think it is really revealing that even like certainly on a lot of sort of online podcasting kind of left circles, like the only, the only acceptable explanation for why Terry McAuliffe lost that election was that like Virginia had just become much more racist than it was a year before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I mean, Certainly not going to deny that the right has like you know demagogic racial appeal. That's certainly true, but like that doesn't really sound right. Like I mean, like and it's so self defeating, you know. Because it's also it's not that, an actionable conclusion. Yeah, right? no, like, exactly. It's, what, it's, like what, <laughs> this is the you know I mentioned like Trey Reed earlier, right? I mean, this is the point that he makes about uh, people who say like racism is America's original sin, and he'll say like I don't know, man. I went to Catholic school. I'm not a believer, but my understanding of original sin is the whole point is you can never ever get rid of yeah. it, right? So yeah. like yeah. this yeah. is yeah. the very so, optimistic political let's pack message. It in. <laughs> Call every day. <laughs> But this actually, so a lot of, okay, a lot of what you both have just said is really, really good and helpful. Um, and so I think I'll, I spend a lot of time thinking about conspiracy theory and conspiracy theories in general. And I'm fairly- I love this for you, Gil. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's why I sleep so well at night. Um, the <laughs> Because I'm so I'm relatively convinced that like the matrix of all conspiracy theories is anti-Semitism, right? And that- um, uh, I buy a lot of like what Sartre says in Anti-Semite and Jew uh, about the way in which it functions as a sort of psychological like release valve mm -hmm. in response to like something true in lived experience about an experience like a, a sensation of relative powerlessness socially and politically. Mm -hmm. So like what you were just saying, David, was really helpful. Like maybe we, we, you know, we're like, where the fuck does this James Lindsay shit come from? And it's like the neoliberalization of the Democratic Party, you know, like the mm -hmm. fact that in general, like what was that study that just came out that was going making the rounds on social media, which was like some study found that like public support for or opposition to policies has <laughs> zero effect on whether those things are implemented as policy. Oh, yeah, I, saw that. yeah like, I, I think that's I think that's an older study, but it's was, it was making its rounds against the Princeton thing, right? That's what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that people like, you know, whether or not they have a good clear eyed analysis of social reality or of politics, generally they don't. But I think people feel that 
that's true, right? I think that they have a sense that, like you said, like they don't have meaningful input democratically in how you know curricula are designed or mm -hmm. how you know redistributive policies exist or don't. Um, and then like now we have to come up with an explanation for why that's the case. Well, we mm -hmm. live in a democratic society, so something must be behind the scenes. You know, mm -hmm. pulling the levers of power, and I don't want to say the J word, so they're globalists, probably. And then, you know, or maybe they're reptoids, or, you know, the same people who are pushing, C like, the vaccine mandates to sterilize and make your children autistic. It's all, like, it's, it's all got the same underlying logic, right, of an attempt to account for the, the feeling of powerlessness mm -hmm. when one is nominally, right, formally, should have democratic input into the way that society is organized. So I don't know. Yeah, I like what you say there, there Gil, because the thing that's been you know, um, bouncing around in my head is that actually one could imagine you know, through any historical epoch, there are probably James Lindsay's you could find. You know, people saying <laughs> weird crackpot things like, you know, James Lindsay's not one of the kind. I'm, I'm sorry, Lindsay, if you're listening. Sorry, James. You know, we, we, we've seen you before. So, you know, I, sometimes the way that I think about these things is, one, you know, we're talking about these individual figures, but we're not making the sort of idealist claims like, you know, they brought this into existence. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what we would need is some sort of explanation of why they seem to be part of a coherent political formation now. What can, what, you know, reason can we give for that? And I think broadly, we can say something like, you know, if we're sticking with America, but I will tell you, like, it's popping up in Canada too. I know sometimes Americans have this sort of utopic idea of Canada that they're, they're immune to these things, but I can tell you like the discourse of woke. Not on what's dude, left of Jordan, philosophy. We know. That we know. Jordan Peterson's your colleague. <laughs> we, we know. <laughs> the reactionary up here. Um, but you know, what we can say, if we're just going to talk about you know, American society, but I think to a lesser extent, you can probably say this for Canada, is that there's a series of like really severe material dislocations that are happening through many people's lives that are impacting them maybe differently, they're interpreting them differently, but you know, there is you know, a desire to understand like, why does it seem like my life is becoming increasingly dysfunctional? Mm -hmm. Why am I increasingly lacking the resources to predictably understand the world that I live in? And that can manifest in the neoliberalization of the Democratic Party. But I also want to play down like you know, the George Floyd protests in 2020 were all at once, like incredible for those of us who are just like, is this what a possible mass movement could look like? But also on the other end, like most people haven't seen anything like that. That also looks like a social system in duress. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, can you provide a coherent explanation for these dislocations? And what we are finding is the party that supposedly represents the left, they can't because to do so would require that they be not what they are. On the other hand, if you have a hodgepodge of the, the Jane Lindsay, um, Jordan Peterson, Chris Rupo constellation, you know, Hydra, you can start to get a mishmash of this is what explains you know what is impinging upon you what hurts you and i think that's a helpful way to try to understand that maybe lindsay the individual doesn't have a coherent politics though i think owen has a little bit to say because he thinks that there might be but they can still be a part of a broader coherent politics that we should be deeply worried about and i think this was part of um owen's question is so what is the vision of social life that you know um these people have and when you look at Jordan Peterson, at least from some of Owen's notes, it's about, well, if you want to make sense of your world, maybe we need to you know, get back to some of these hierarchies that do make sense. Mm -hmm. Why yeah. are we trying to turn the whole world upside down? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel, I mean, I certainly don't want to, you know, look as a person of partially globalist descent, you know, I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to minimize, you know, Gil's <laughs> point about how central that is to, you know, most conspiracy theories. Uh, but uh, but I feel like in, in Peterson's case, it's, it's less, uh, you know, it's less anti-Semitism, there's a little bit of that there implicitly, but, you know, but it's, it, and, and more sort of trying to redirect it to, you know, anxieties about sex and gender and, you know, yeah. stuff like that, right? I mean, like, like I, I, I remember, I always loved, uh, there was this New York Times profile of Jordan Peterson in like 2018, that uh, one of the last lines in the profile is, uh, he's, you know, they're, um, you know, talking to people in like line for a Jordan Peterson event. And there's this guy who says, you know, it's really great for me to, to, to hear this guy saying, you know, like actually saying hierarchy is okay. 
and then they did the little, you know, said Andrew, whatever, 45, a waiter. And I was like, wait, 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 right? Like, like, do you think the most important hierarchies in your life are ones that you're on top of, right? Like, I mean, like, you know, doesn't seem like it, right? So, uh, you know, but, but what, um, you know, uh, like, but that's kind of the thing, right? You have this sense that your life is is dislocated. Uh, it, it it might be, you know, much you know, like that. That probably you're more socially atomized, you know, than than people in your your parents' generation were. It might be harder for you to start relationships, etc. And rather than blaming like economic precarity and you know and, and being stressed out all the time and etc. It's so much easier to just blame, you know, women, which is basically what the Jordan Peterson message yeah. is. Yeah, I mean, I, I think to the extent that there is like philosophy in what these guys mm. say, and I'm not convinced totally that there is a lot, but to the extent that there is, I think that what they present is a sort of crude like pragmatism. Like it's a response to an experience of like dislocation or like Will, you were alluding to the kind of delegitimation of political institutions and um, and social structures. And so what they offer is like, to the extent that they have a positive project, mm -hmm. it seems to me like the, the offer is that, look, society like works better and it's better integrated when we just accept like certain hierarchies and there's a kind of pragmatic value um, to staving off chaos or something by um, by accepting these maybe imperfect but you know we accept these hierarchies and so what's being offered I think is in the context of this like political delegitimation is what oftentimes appears to a lot of people I think as a choice between a kind of crude pragmatism of like this makes society work better it's better with police and strong men and and all of this stuff versus the moral purity or the the offer of like moral purification that is being presented in certain segments of like the liberal left or whatever, like here's how, you know, here's, here's how you, you know, what's best for society is to cultivate these particular moral virtues, right? And, or at least the appearance. And you'll never actually ever succeed, which what an enticing political project telling people, <laughs> don't worry, you'll always be corrupted and we'll damn yeah. you even as yeah. you try it. Yeah. yeah, so like, yeah, let's just resuscitate some of the old stuff, which seemed to work better. Things seemed to kind of feel better before, or at least in our imaginations <laughs> they did, right? Like, And so, um, you know, here's the you kind of- You have imperfect memories. So yeah, yeah, exactly. So here's the kind of crude pragmatic argument. And I guess if you put it next to the moral purity, you know, offer, or the moral purification offer, it looks really appealing. I don't know. That's one way I think of looking at it. Yeah, and I mean, it's, it's not like, it's not entirely wrong. That things used to be better. It's just that that you know, it's 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 yeah. just a you know correlation causality thing, right? I mean, like that's yeah. like you know, that's like yeah. I mean, clearly, like even you know, even in the nineties, never mind, you know, like the seventy, like you know, that like if you, like if you drove a cab for a living, right? Mm -hmm. You know, your your life was very different from what it is if you're an Uber driver in two thousand and twenty two, and like this is way 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 worse. It's just that that's. <laughs> It's just that the reason it's worse isn't that like, I don't know, you have to be aware of the existence of trans people now or like- Yeah, like yeah, that. yeah, that's I was gonna say, yeah. <laughs> that, that's, what really, no, yeah that's what really ruins society. We now have to be aware. But I, here's what I find actually interesting what's going on with Lindsay and all of that. You know, they are hijacking what we might think of as actually a laudable intuitive sense that people have of, you know, of, resisting or wanting to push back against domination. And mm -hmm. you know, if we're using sort of Republican concepts, so much of what their lingua franca is, these people wanna tell you how to live your life. They wanna tell you and interfere in how your family is, how, what your thoughts are, what your children are. They're using this language of domination. Now, obviously what they're obscuring is, is that actually most of us already live under conditions of domination, that there actually are already structures that do tell you how to live, how you're going to make your, your living. But the, the issue is that, you know, some of the structures, you know, for lack of a better term, it's a, you know, we want to say something like, you know, economic forces and market anarchy is at least a huge element of dislocation people try. That is incredibly abstract. You know, like, where, where do I find these economic forces? You can find where, you know, it's concrete, like, you know, you lose your job at the factory or something like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what the, the, the Lindsay Hydra head offers is, no, no, no. We can give you, like, you know, the concrete 
people and institutions that are responsible for this. And so the way that I think it's like, it's hijacking this sense of we should be anti-domination and then explaining the cause behind it in a completely different, and I wouldn't say arbitrary, but I'll say arbitrary for the sense of like, this doesn't make any sense, man. Mm. And I think that's what's kind of worrying is that people should be worried about domination, right? They should be worried about arbitrary interference. They should be able to explain that and insofar as you have a left that doesn't do that, then you you lock us into a position of, well, these people are just ridiculous. Mm. You know, they don't know what they're talking about. And not actually addressing that actually maybe conditions of domination really are to you know, the explanation here. I mean, that's, uh, that, you know, this is exactly how, how Peterson, you know, makes his, his career, right, is refusing to call people by, like, their pronouns. And the way that he presented that it right was that he was taking a brave stance saying you will not tell me how to think right so brave what <laughs> you know I mean, which was i remember when the, those videos were happening before we knew what this was going to be and being like god what a weird guy losing what a weird his mind goober. in the middle of the quad right now no, we'll never hear from him again little though. did i know that this guy <laughs> was going to become like the the stand-in paragon for masculinity for you know millions of young men how yeah, far we fall right i feel like i can remember a time when the paragons of masculinity were a little bit less hysterical and weepy than that oh, oh he cries all the time yeah. it's just always okay, crying I, the last time I saw oh, him cry, he was crying at a video he made because he loves Great Britain so much <laughs> and, the le- and the legacy of the British. And he literally fucking cries at the end because he can't take all the pain it causes him when people talk about colonialism and all these other parts of, of British history. The dude wept for, for, mm. for Britain of all places. England, really. <laughs> a cursed <laughs> island in the North Sea. <laughs> like yeah. you know, real real men cry over break. Like I guess <laughs> that's not a turn I saw coming. That's not a turn I saw coming. I, I, I cannot imagine John Wayne no. having any tears over anything. He's probably like, I don't even know that country. I don't even what know what he's talking about. So some oh of this God. is just so confounding, right? Like you know, like and here's a weird thing I will say, but you know. Well, weird thing with Jordan Peterson is, you know, if he's like somehow getting guys to get more in touch with their emotions and clean their rooms, I get, I'm, a, I'm, I'm guess like I'm, I'm in favor of that actually. Yeah. Then it's just like then the lobster stuff starts coming in. I'm like, oh, okay, wait. wait. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I think I'm a centrist on the first part of that. I think there's such a thing as being too in touch with your emotions, and maybe if you're weeping fair, over Great fair. Britain, that that might be. You know. <laughs> Take a step back a little bit, but uh, <laughs> you know the cleaning the rooms or the repression. you know sitting with your back straight, and all that. That's all. That's all good advice. You know, it's it, it's just um, like out of the original like twelve rules, like most of them are fine. There's the thing about child rearing, which is a little authoritarian and weird, and like I don't know, I don't know if. Um, I remember when I, when I said this to Michael Brooks, he said I was being too much of a nerd about it, but like, you know, but like, I, I, I don't know that you should actually just pet random stray don't cats. Don't pet random street. cats! <laughs> <laughs> like, certainly if you have cats at home, you know, you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> you should know better. They're monsters. They'll fuck you <laughs> up. <laughs> but other than that, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all fine, Basically, right? I mean, like, there's, there's nothing, yeah. yeah, there's nothing wrong with telling people that. I mean, I've, you know, look, you go to occasional DSA meeting, you'll meet you'll meet people who could use a lot of this advice and you know profit from it, you know. But the uh, but like fine, right? But like the problem is that it's presenting what's you know perfectly anodyne good advice about how to live your life as a person as a solution to systemic problems, right? You know, right. And, and yeah. in a way, mm-hmm. I think that Peterson is kind of a transitional figure in the like recent evolution of the lunatic right because. In some ways, right, I think David's exactly right. I mean, like the, the, the pronoun thing, you know, I think is, I was really an anticipation of like the way a lot of the equivalent, like the way a lot of like James Lindsay talks, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but like in other ways, it's like this, this much more old fashioned kind of conservatism because, um, you know, he's not really like, you know, with Peterson, like, you know, he hadn't really taken the weird pseudo populist turn so much the right has, has, has had, right? I mean, he's, you know, like Peterson, at least in his heyday, you know, he certainly wasn't talking about like elites really that much, right? I mean, he was mm-hmm. talking about how you should, you know, try to move up in, in the hierarchies of your life and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and, 
you know, like she tried to become a like in the league. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, exactly, right? You know, where whereas now, like all of these guys uh, have made this transition to this uh, this view that uh, that there's some sort of you know, like like they'll use phrases like ruling class, even. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I, I see Incredible. Republicans all the time saying corporate is an insult, you know, like like they mm-hmm. they're all trying to channel that energy in their own way. Corporate communism, I've uh, heard lately. That's absolutely true. There is like communism for the rich. You know what I mean? Like this is like what Will's point is, is that like. Well, they just own the means actually, of production. Like, I think what I find really challenging a lot about this <gasps> is that the the le- there's so many levels of discontent that like the truth that so some of it is true like so for example when they started talking about how there was like a ring of pedophiles like running our government and shit and then like the Je- Epstein case came out and like you're wrong. not I was like no you're not wrong shit. there are like you hate to see but- it. <laughs> I mean like what's crazy is that actually things are as fucked up as they think. Like they, they like, are the sickos that people imagine them to be. Yes, yes, I, th- that's the thing. It's just that, like, it's you. It's for reasons that are completely, like, different. Like, they're just like not on the plane of like rational explanation. But like, when they say things like, "Yeah, there's a ring of pedophiles running your government," it's like, "Yo, but it, there is though." <laughs> and like, <laughs> and yeah, like, there's, like, like it's to take pictures with the guy. But how many rich people is there just like there's a photo way out there just like this you? I'm like, did you all hang out with that Steve? I mean, even the elite academics, right? You've seen the pictures with like Steven Pinker Steven and fucking Dershowitz. Pinker. Dershowitz yeah. and, uh, we're yeah. about to get blocked. He he blocks religiously, so oh yeah. I'm sorry, Steve. <laughs> he's yeah, he's another one. He's just a completely bankrupt apologist. It's it's shocking what sort of intellectual like malpractice that guy gets away with. Yeah, I mean, I do have a take on that, but I think there should be at least a minute of like just generally dunking on how horrible he is before doing the nuance thing. <laughs> I think he's got dumb hair. Yeah, I, I, I like Ben doing, actually, let's get the candy before the vegetables. <laughs> uh, before we do that, the, the one last question I'd like to ask about, you know, what I'm calling the Hydra monster, the, the Lindsay and all of that. You know, with the, this change in language, now, of course, language isn't everything, but it is striking using language like ruling class, corporate, all of that. I wonder if, you know, another, you know, worrisome consequence of this is, um, is of a certain segment of the left actually being wooed into thinking that this is a productive alliance with these ideas. And so I think, you know, like, you know, <clears throat> I'm all about dialect. But I am not sure, you know, the politics we need is anti-woke, anti-anti-woke. And mm-hmm. so sometimes it seems as if it becomes a sort of death spiral of, you know, of the, the left starting to absorb, like, you know, I don't know, they're saying these things that we should say because they obviously alienated from a sort of mm-hmm. corporatist neoliberal party. And I just, you know, I wonder if there's a worry of not realizing the coherent politics behind this language and, you know, buying in and thinking, well, maybe we should chase that because it, it seems as if we could build a politics ground up from this Hydra monster. I don't know. I feel I like I think I hear what you're saying. I just I'm not sure I'm convinced at like how large that group of people is, like very yeah. online people. <laughs> like I, I think that there's like a whole post left like thing happening. There are people who seem to make arguments that there's like populist alliances that are possible. Mm-hmm. Um like I see what you're saying. Like I, I'm, and maybe I'm wrong about this. I just, I think that this is like a very, I think this is more niche. Like I think most people know that these, that this is like Looney Town. Yeah, I think um, that's. I think Lillian's right. That's just like a handful of traitors and idiots. Yeah, but what I would say though that will, what Will is saying is true is that like, there is this problem that I've like the the weakness of the left. Like, I actually have. I used to think that you know. So I was recruited to the left and like that little like tiny little world in which there were actually organized groups that like thought they were more important than they were and so on and so forth. And there is a common lineage and and tradition. And you kind of like took for granted when you're talking about the left that you're talking about something like distinct from liberalism or whatever, 
since 2016, like the world of the left has like blown up and that's a good thing. But it also means that like, given it's like middle-class cultural milieu, the fact that it's just like mm. in general, like more prone to the culturalist politics. I think that the left with a bit, the major ideological problem is that the left doesn't actually share any common principles. Like, I think it's mm. a, like the number of like the number of, areas in which I hear just people throwing around the word leftist. Like, I didn't know I would ever get tired of that word. I just think that's a bullshit word. I don't know what you're talking about. Like I, mm-hmm. um, so mm-hmm. just like the fact that like, I think the left, you know, when I think about like moral universalism, a commitment to civil liberties and like a genuine sense, I think about um, redistributive politics, decommodifying things, um, actual like liberal pluralism, like in a sense where mm-hmm. like the critique of liberalism isn't that like, we hate that you can have the freedom to do things that we actually want you to have the freedom to live the way you want. And part of the way we do that is through redistributive policies and moral universalism. Like there's a political vision that I actually don't think people share anymore. That was common to the old left and even the new left. I think the postmodern left and what creates this like fucked up culture war environment is that that is not true anymore. And um, that's just like an a cult, an outcome of the 2016 era that like I didn't expect. I thought like the Bernie campaign was gonna like win more people to that, and I think it did in a certain sense. But it also like because there's no infrastructure. There, like I mean, DSA is just kind of like you know, there's just organizational problems with like bringing mm-hmm. people into that organization, being effective, and so on. I'm not dissing it. I truly, I think it's great that it that it's grown. But clearly, where to go next is an obvious question. What actually brings people together aside from cultural affinity is, um, I think, t- like TBD. Like, if there's something there, but it's not clear. Yeah, uh, I think I think that's really I think that's really good. I think it's I think the part about uh, you know parts about universalism and civil yeah. liberties are really worth circling totally, and underlining. Totally, you know, because, totally. because I think if you look at the way that people do and don't push back against like the James Lindsay's of the world, I think that that's I think that's really mm. revealing, right? Like so. In other words, like, it, it seems like, I mean, if nothing else, the anti-CRT laws are a golden opportunity for, like, the, the left to reclaim where the people who actually care about free speech and open discussion and all that yeah. stuff, right? I mean, like, totally. like and, and mostly that's not the line of attack that people use, right? You know, like, 99.999% of the time, the line of attack is... You know these people who who support these laws are horrible racists, which might be true, but like I I, I don't think it's I don't think it's maybe the most politically salient you know truth nice. to uh, you know to to focus on you know and 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 I think that uh, and, and I I do agree with Lillian I think that these are like the sort of people who like think that you know you can have an actual alliance with the populist right or whatever are mostly marginal although i do think that there's like their degrees of marginality you mm-hmm. know there uh you know between like just to you know very roughly right you know your you know your amy Teresa's and your jimmy doors whatever right there's there's a range there right you know but like i think that um but i i think that that doesn't like like the thing that's bad about that right so so we'll use this phrase earlier like what was it like uh anti-woke and anti-anti-woke or something like that right yeah. and, and i think that there's maybe a version of that that's like correct depending on what we're reading into the word woke uh, yeah. that, uh that's like uh that's sort of saying some of the things that like some people in this little group that you know you correctly dislike uh would not along to but like interpreting them in a very different way right like saying like yeah uh, it is a good message to send. That's like, yeah, we're we're annoyed by all the same, you know, we're you know we're annoyed by all this stuff, you know, we're not trying, you know, like, sure, you know, they have a, um, it's cringe, yes, yes, all of this stuff is very cringe, you know, we don't care about any of that. What we care about is, you know, getting you, you know, like having people have good jobs and you know, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like, I think the thing that's missing from the people who think there is some kind of lights to be, to be made there um who i hope are very marginal is just like that i think that needs to be aggressively combined with calling out the fact that like people who claim to be right-wing po- populists are just con artists mm-hmm. yeah. uh, I, I i do think that like 
you know, the, the people who are trying to create this, yeah, like left anti-woke, you know, alliance, right? And like, that's, that's what's missing. I think a lot of this comes out of, you know, God love them. I mean, like Bernie Sanders changed the game, you know, um, but there's, we're, we're in this weird moment right now, I think politically without the, the kind of the hope, for example, of another Sanders campaign, which was sort of never called, would call truce for, you know, a few months and come together. Um, that's not going to happen again. Right? We have to build something new. And there's there's a couple of things. It's like one is like this media strategy things like a lot of people think that like Bernie Sanders doesn't win um, in 2016 because there wasn't enough independent media. Don't get me wrong. I think independent media is great. I'm an independent journalist myself. I think it's very important for us to be able to build our own narrative. Um, but it's like we could have the like the left. We could have problem. the left wing CNN and Bernie Sanders, <laughs> I think, would have still lost. He's saying what's left of philosophy had only done this four years earlier. You know, <laughs> that wasn't going to turn the tide. But, but, no, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, not only that about the, the media, but there's also this kind of idea that some people have this, like, if we just created, like, this perfect, like, Frankenstein, you know, candidate who was just, like, really crass and, you know, was, didn't care about, you know, using slurs and stuff, but was, like, ready to fight for working people, you know, that would also be the present, like, there's, like, there are structural impediments for why we don't come in, in into power, um, and beyond that, when we do come into power, being able to implement the kind of things that we want to implement as socials takes a very different kind of politics than just, you know, having the most votes necessarily at, you know, at the end of, you know, an election day, right? We have to build the social base that we can take on insurance companies and, you know, fight for Medicare for all and all that kind of stuff, right? And I think there's a lot of people who were brought into the Bernie Sanders campaign because of like the message and the hope and like the idea, like, oh no, there's something possible in politics, but there was no real development of political consciousness for people to understand it as something other than, I don't know, a media exercise. What we have right now, um, at least on like the left and like the post left people in the doors, because I'm I'm a I'm a bridge builder, you know. Like I see the groups of people who are getting really worked up in the, the stuff, even the force the vote thing, which I disagreed with, right? And I'd like I see like you're mad about this. You think that the people in power are pigs. You think that they're trying to screw you. I agree with you. Let's find a way to to build something. Um, and and they're. So I'm always looking to those groups. So, okay, how can we find ways to, to, to work with them? But it, it frightens me um, a lot because I realize that what is being sold to a lot of people is like, you know, what, you know, what Anton Yeager was calling like hyper politics, right? We're like, people are like really engaged right now where everybody feels like the world is really politicized, but your actual like ability to, to like do anything with your politics um, is very limited. That's why we have so many people being like, I have created, I have found like my perfect ideology. I'm like a, a Maoist with a little bit of like Trotskyist tendencies, you know, mixed, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of like yeah, weird yeah, yeah, Frank. Yeah. Everyone's yeah, I've really seen obsessed. like those quizzes, like answer these yeah. questions will tell you what you are. Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's like, <laughs> as if politics, like the goal of politics is to come out into the public square and say like, I am a, you know, I'm a Maoist, <laughs> right? And then like things start to change. It's like, no, I mean, I mean, it's great. Obviously I, I think theory is important and all that kind of stuff is important, but like there, there's a kind of backwards, relationship where like everything becomes just like a reflection of you as an individual instead of as a member of a political class um you know mo most importantly you know an economic class right um and i i don't know like i feel like a lot of the weird things that we see from our side like with that anti-woke stuff and even people who we like does come out of this kind of real like ideological problem where a lot of people have a difficult time like conceptualizing um what what politics are and it it, it creates a great opportunity for um you know not just like the post love people but even like the Lindsay folks who i think have have pulled people over i know peter i've seen people like you know i grew up poor in the south and like i remember being so stoked when i saw people who i hadn't talked to in like eight years um you know going all into bernie sanders right like this is the thing and like we're volunteering it's like ah, i can't believe this guy's like now engaged in politics at some level it's really exciting and then four years later you know it's it's peterson and it's like hyper conspiracy theory stuff and not that they've necessarily shifted the voting to the right they've pretty much just you know clocked out of of politics in, in that way right um anyways I, I bring that up more than anything it's like you know to say like this is like our challenge right so like it's trying to bring an anti-woke politics into left one i think that would be wrong morally um and 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 two it would just also be wrong strategically because the reason that the right is so reliant on the anti-woke stuff is because they don't have very much else to stand on like to bring people in right mm -hmm. so feeling that we're going to beat them at their kind of cheap game because that's all that they have is i think would also be a, a, a strategic mistake as well yeah i think right. that's right i don't i feel yeah. like there's 
you know that interview where like Bernie very famously like sits down and the and the interviewer is like upset because he doesn't like want to talk about his family or his wife or whatever and he has that like list of things and he's just like this is what I want to talk about. I like literally think that just like the mantra of the contemporary love should just be like stay on topic. Stay on point, like, please. Like, it's actually like not necessary. That's where the principles to- come in. Right, like that's what I'm saying. It's actually not necessary to respond to all of the culture war shit. Like, actually, you can just shut the fuck up sometimes and like stay on topic. And like, because I I, I genuinely believe it's not possible to beat the right at the culture game um, if you don't have anything else to, if like if you have no other institutional, moral, or financial, or just like like political resources, like that's what you want to spend your social capital on. I started realizing this like. I don't know, I think it must have been 2020 at some point where like I used to always feel like I had to take a position on like culture <laughs> war stuff and then I at some point I realized actually I don't I can just not care about this <laughs> like that this can just not be my moment to not have an opinion because I have other things to to think about and like I think mm-hmm. that the the liberal mainstream way of thinking about politics and morality is like if you don't have an opinion if you don't like formulate that i just even within just the people closest to and you don't voice that then you are somehow contributing to the other side winning like the moral battle is like you know it's not enough but it's very important but like actually it's not important because if you don't i mean if someone asks your opinion or you have a public platform you know don't say the wrong thing and like you know, use your power for good and not evil. But like, for the most of us who like, you know, we're not being looked to for political opinions and cultural hot takes are not like what I'm I'm good at. It's like, stay on topic. Like, I don't need to contribute to like waste my intellectual energy doing this. I want to make arguments for why capitalism is bad. I want to make arguments for why socialism would be better. That's it. Like, that's, that's the whole of my project. And it like, period. Like, and uh, yeah. I don't know, I don't know how Preach. to like, be, I, I became like really s- simple minded over the course of like the pandemic. And like the more I was just, you know, I'm not in a political organization anymore. I used to be, but like I moved to Berlin. I'm like by myself, I'm like seeing the online discourse and I'm like, I feel like I have to have a take about this. Like, what's the right move? And like, if I, if I don't have the right take, then like, you know, am I giving like, you know, how am I positioning myself? And it's like, actually that doesn't matter. Like how I am positioning myself doesn't always it's not important and like the problem is is that all of the intellectual energy goes in that direction so like the correct direction is toward the things that would make allow us to in the future make any difference yeah that's why principles are so important right you know i i i sometimes worry that you know the, yeah, I like the way that you put it, Ben. Um, it was either Ben, ben or David. I think both of you are making this point about you know, how is it that we're conceptualizing politics? And so, you know, with these anti CRT laws, I think you were right, Ben. You know, this is a moment to enunciate a positive principle defense of free speech. But, you know, what I see from a lot of, of liberals, maybe some leftists, is they think actually what's sufficient for this politics is to show look at them being coherent. They said that they like free speech, but they don't, as if simply showing that these people contradict themselves or they they lack your know, moral rectitude that's the substance of politics well it's, it it's also it's also a cheap way of not ha- not enunciating a principle right because right. it's like because mm-hmm. yeah. because if you're just accusing people you know correctly if they're hypocritical about it okay great but like in which direction do you want them to to like resolve <laughs> that inconsistency oh, you know like like exactly. are you you know yeah yeah, you, yeah. Like, is the is the message like oh it, you know so see it is silly to care about free speech you know or is it uh, mm-hmm. or is the is the message no like free speech actually actually does matter here's like the the robust uh, defense of it yeah I absolutely love what Lillian said I mean I think you know you could have the energy about this like of um, it's like that scene in uh, in Goodfellas when Henry Hill the monologue is is explaining how, you know, the shakedown works and, you know, it doesn't matter what the excuse the business owner gives is, you know, how to fire, fuck you, pay me, you know, yeah, the yeah. place was hit by lightning, fuck you, pay me, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, no, there's like, there's like a version of that that's like, you know, it's like, oh, what do you think, uh, you know, what do you think about, you know, Ibermex Kendi's anti-racist baby book? I don't know, fuck you, you know, you need some healthcare, you know? Like, <laughs> fuck you, let's decommodify <laughs> healthcare. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's, but I think it's, what I do think is universal healthcare. 
right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But I do think it's really revealing, though, for Lillian that like you became more tempted to engage in these kinds of discursive interventions when you moved to Berlin and you were in a bit more, and also COVID happened, um, and you were in a more kind of like solitary frame. Because I think one of the, the biggest challenge, I probably, or one of the biggest challenges to kind of developing and cultivating this kind of principles and discipline, principle discipline is atomization, right? It's very hard to, like when you're on your own and you're siloed, I mean, the the quickest path to agency, or at least what feels like agency, mm. right, is reading about it, things and tweeting about things and saying things. And I mean, I it's hard. I don't see that. I don't know what to yeah. do about this though, because atomization is not a problem that can be kind of like solved very easily because it's a symptom of economic structures of um, uh, even it's even a symptom of you know geographic structures in. Um, in in North America, which are heavily suburbanized and which have a tendency to silo and isolate us, which just primes us for this kind of, you know, discursive intervention oriented politics. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that th I guess I suppose it's like a big question. But if if the the primary obstacle, given that we recognize that the issue that we're facing is one of this kind of yeah siloed atomization that prevents us from cultivating stronger group formations, maybe unions also used to provide uh, a certain forum in which to, you know, uh, a certain forum in which to cultivate a kind of group, not identity, but a group kind of formation and group agency. But with the decline of unions and the geographic atomization and suburbanization of life, and, um, you know, COVID has made that all much worse too, in terms of our isolation. I just wonder like what, I don't know, I guess sort of concretely how it is that we start addressing those obstacles, you know? Unfortunately, I think the first thing to say is I don't think there's a silver bullet sort of oh, yeah. put the switch and turn it turn it off. I think, you know, a part of the work of politics is understanding the short-term goals, mid-term goals, and also long-term goals. Mm -hmm. And an another thing, I I mean, like, I have, I, I've been having a lot of fun doing this, you know, and I think, you know, what's, like, you know, important doing this conversation that we're having is, like, you know, also showing that, you know, this, you know, formation of the new reactionary mind, you know, is, you know, the use that hoary Gramsci term, a morbid symptom. And, you know, to say that this isn't coming from nowhere, it's not like, you know, again, someone flipped the light switch and all of a sudden rationality went out the window and now these people in the driver's seat. No, this is a product of a lot of policy and social decisions over an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps with also our expectations of what politics can secure, which is it's not going to be immediate. I hope I go viral with this dunk that I did. It's going to be long, patient work, but also analyzing why there are structural impediments to things like atomization. I, it's not because, and sometimes I worry about this. I, I've given into this of being like, oh, the culture is really sort of lower globally or, or nationally, the intelligence of people. These aren't bad people who are engaging with it. Yes, I find some of them annoying and all of that, but I think there, there's an explanation we can give of why so many people are diverting their energy or seeming like so many people are diverting their energy to these things that are dead ends. And I think it's just important not to, it's important to make fun of the Lindsay's and all of that, but understand like the people engaged with all of this, we, we shouldn't hate them. We shouldn't be like, you know, you know, why don't you just make better choices? You know, it's a really tough pickle for um, left politics. Yeah, I mean, it's on the left to provide a more compelling understanding of what's going on, right? And if we don't, then, then, uh, then that's when the Lindsay's and Petersons have their have their entry. Yeah, no, a hundred a hundred percent. I mean, I, th I think that. Um, I mean, yeah, and it's tricky because I mean, I I I like a lot of what Will's saying, and and I think that there is a important messy distinction here about uh, political commentary versus politics. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, that they're like, what could you do, you know, if you're podcaster basically to to reverse all those trends that will's talking about literally nothing right i mean like that that's not your you know and, and the idea that you can i mean like david mentioned force the vote earlier mm -hmm. you know when, when all that was going on right sometimes like if you if you said publicly oh i, I think this is badly thought out you know people would say oh okay smart guy what's what's your what's your plan it's like what's my plan for achieving this like massive victory against capital and like <laughs> Like, I, 
I, I, I actually mean, have I, a button that's turned <laughs> socialism on. I, I'm, I'm dusting it off now. Let's go for like, it, actually. Like, 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 this is like, this is like approximately the equivalent of like thinking that, um, you know, thinking that like since Skip Bayless like talks about football a lot he would make a good quarterback like that's 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 <laughs> like the, you know like the, these are just two different roles right you know it's like like mm. commenting on politics and actually doing politics and obviously i think you should try to do the first thing in a way that's going to be helpful to the second mm -hmm. thing and certainly not harmful to it i think everything we've been talking about goes to how you can do it in a way that's helpful but it, it is inevitably an auxiliary role i mean like like like, like yeah what's the plan I, I, mean, I don't know rebuild the labor movement uh you know, find 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 groups that are actually like knocking on doors and stuff that you could hook up with, right? But that's not what people mean. What they mean is like, what what can I do on my computer uh, yeah. to to do this? And, and you can't. You want to hear my personal philosophy? I've just read a book about stoicism. I've decided that you have to be a stoic existentialist. You have to like stay on topic, and then thrust yourself toward freedom. You know what I mean? <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Stoicism's making a comeback, 2022. And they thought I couldn't do more moral philosophy, he, and yet here I am. <laughs> here you are. I never doubted you. So, okay, uh, this has all been extremely uh, sharp and serious and um, politically astute and savvy. And this I ended think up being way more productive than we intended. Yeah, right? the title of this video, listen, the title of this video was too rich. Unpro yeah. Unproductive Dunking on James Lindsay and Associated Reactionaries. And Oops. I'd like to do a little bit of that uh, while I've got you all here. So I've pulled first a couple of tweets from our boy. Let's uh, go. And again, by the way, just to, just as a just as a reminder, we've already had the discussion about how we know this is not productive and real politics happens elsewhere. Okay, but um, just listen to some or of the things joy. this goofball says. Um, just and and part of why I want to share some of these with you is because I am genuinely incapable of sorting out what the fuck is going on in a lot of these uh, tweets. Okay, so uh, here's one: November nineteenth, twenty twenty one. Quote, the leftists want to establish a Nazi regime in America. Iron law of woke projection. Okay. Wait, projecting? Wait, what is the... Wait, who's projecting? projecting? Yeah. <laughs> yes. You want to hear, hear it again? You just heard I was thrusting myself toward freedom. That's like me pro projecting. <laughs> it's a projection. Um, starts next. Oh, okay, boy. here's another one. Couple, uh, February 15th. CRT is warmed over Nazi ideology that replaces Jew with white, and then, just for shits and giggles, accuses Jews of having white privilege and having positioned themselves to rise to the top of whiteness, set its course, and then deny it. It's like wow. nine-dimensional chess. That's like reading Hegel. It, it's I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to get the philosophy right now. Like, oh yeah. man. Yeah. I, again, like the steps here are really hard to follow. Uh, well, the, oh, the man does oh. claim that he spends 16 hours a day reading critical race theory. That's so true. And uh, <laughs> that, he said that. <laughs> and, uh, he did say that. This is what much time for what sleeping. All those do well, especially because point. he clearly spends at least seven hours a day tweeting. So, I mean, that's so like much. a maximum <laughs> of one hour a day of sleep. I'm not sure so, how many hours some... there's the explanation. My man is overworked and underslept. That's true. <laughs> And this is uh, how like a nice social system again. could help out our boy James. You know, oh, he yeah. needs to he get needs some time off. We need to make sure he gets some paid vacation. Yeah, <laughs> more hands makes this work, right? Come on. Stay on top of it. <laughs> yeah, he's really overburdened. Like he's in high demand. Like there need more interpreters. Have you ever interpreters. seen him laugh or or smile? Literally I mean, or Peterson never. too. Have ever seen him laugh? Or, <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah. It's curious. Oh, no, we've only it's seen different. Jordan Peterson cry. Apparently, I've seen him cry many. Times the guy, yeah, yeah. yeah. Needs to change yep. the proportion of weeping to to laugh to laughing and jocularity. <laughs> well, this actually, I mean, we've said this a bunch of times on the pod and in discussions with one another that, like, you know, part of what it is incumbent on us as leftists today to do is, as Owen just said, like, you know, articulate like what a better world could look like, but also like to get away from the sadness of like moralistic liberal spectacle politics, because mm -hmm. like. You know how thinking in, in this sort of way about like um, like affective identification, like who the fuck wants to follow Jordan Peterson? The dude, like 
if if it means that I have to cry about understand. yeah if I have to cry about like what they've done to Cinderella like all the time or whatever he's always talking about Disney movies and crying profusely about but this goes back to Lillian's thing about what makes it so sad is like what are we doing wrong that makes <laughs> that <laughs> even <laughs> have any fucking appeal so <laughs> one of the best things about Jordan Peterson at least I was um you know, very proud of her for a moment is that, you know, he only eats beef, right? Yes. Um, oh, and at first I was like, hell yeah, that's like super manly. He just only eats beef. He eats steak for dinner every night. And then it turns out though, which is, look, I love steak, so that sounds nice, but he doesn't yeah. season it. He can't have anything on it. It has to be a hundred percent just like pure <laughs> beef because pure he's beef. on this extremely strict diet. So yeah. like, I love I that about Jordan Peterson. That, like even him. the thing that was like, oh man, you know what? He sucks in a lot of ways, but at least he's badass. He only eats but, red meat. He actually well, found a way to make that really boring and like well, tedious. Well, he said, to, and don't forget, and then almost too, that, died from it too. Well, well, exactly. Well, also, one of the downsides <laughs> of that diet is that he did say too that he relayed this story to Joe Rogan, right? That he once had a sip of apple cider and it completely demoed him for a month. He was oh, out for the month, crazy. like knocked out yeah. his system, his hyper masculine system. Couldn't well, handle the like, like, what is impending this doom. <laughs> he said, he said it was the sulfites or something. Or, is yeah. this like the right wing slave morality? You know what I mean? I feel like Nietzsche would be like really upset about this guy. He would be like, <laughs> you can't like you can't be touched by foreign substances. Like you're gonna cry if you can't have it just so. Mm -hmm. And like oh, you're so oh, like oh. you're so like tender. Like there's just something really strange. <laughs> Do you know how bad you have to be to be right wing and Nietzsche's like. Oh man, no, yeah. no, no. no. <laughs> the funniest you thing know about what I, mean, like, I, I love no, that. totally. I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I, he's I he's also, antichrist. <laughs> I don't know. That makes him sound badass again. I think I've heard yeah, that. Be careful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotta worry about that. Yeah. I love that Joe, that Joe Rogan interview too, because Joe Rogan's like, "What apple cider? Are you serious?" And he's like, "Yeah, oh yes, <laughs> it gave me an overwhelming sense of impending doom." And it's like, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so cool. I think it was so much. I think even Jerome was like, oh no, I like this sounds like this sounds, this sounds like way too weird. Yeah. I mean, maybe there's like a lesson though in the kind of like tricky way that, that <laughs> Peterson managed to turn self-help into like political proselytizing. Like there's something incredible. And maybe something to be learned about the way that like 12 rules for life will, starts with, okay, make your bed. And then, you know, it's like stand up straight, look people in the eyes mm -hmm. by like chapter three. And then by chapter 11, it's like patriarchy has ancestral roots <laughs> and it's actually really good. And we should uphold the patriarchy and it will make you much happier if you learn to love the patriarchy and all this stuff. And it's like, well, how the, it's like, how do you, it is incredible at it actually because well it's incremental right and then and all of a sudden you get there and that's why you i've met so many people in my personal life reasonable people who were like yeah yeah just uh, have you heard of this jordan peterson guy or students mm -hmm. i've had um what do you think of jordan <laughs> peterson and i think that this is what it, like you know and again i maybe i think there might be something to be learned there like you start with these like incremental you incrementally move from these like really almost self-evident truths to something that is maybe not so evident that is, you know, uh, based on them. Well, in the same way, like it's about like how you smuggle in, like you, someone was asking before in this conversation, like what is the actual like actionable policy in a lot of these mm -hmm. like reactionary, I would call them grifters, right? Uh, and like, if you look for instance at like a Ben Shapiro, like eight, eight you know, 70% of the time he's saying things that are just like weird red meat for his conspiracy addled audience. And it's like, none of this is actionable. This is bananas, you know, and it's, you know, weird moral panics about gender fluidity or whatever. And it's like, I don't know what the fuck any of this means. And then it's like, oh, but you know, you, so you come for that, but you stay for the like anti-regulating fossil fuels, right? Like that's yeah. like, that gets in under the radar somehow where it's like, oh no, like this is all part of the same sort Perhaps of like ideological need more mash. charter schools. Yeah, 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 right, yeah. yeah. Privatization <laughs> and deregulation of like the, the fossil economy is like I mean, actually that's definitely there. one way that the neoliberal right must find them useful, right? Mm -hmm. Like yes. that. Okay, well, you can bring people in with these con this confusing message about transing kids at school and stuff, and before they know it, like they're actually pro gutting public health schools and, and more charter schools, fracking. Pu yeah, pu public health. Yeah, I mean, public health care, uh, gutting public schools and all that. Yeah. 
more fracking. I, I take the I take the Ben Shapiro and, and the Jordan Peterson stuff like very seriously, if nothing else, just like personally, because I know so many young guys or you know, maybe somebody's younger brother or somebody like that who just get sucked in. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, mm-hmm. to this stuff. And not only does it make their politics bad, obviously, but it just makes them really, really angry all the time. Just yeah. walking around town really crazy. And you know, I'm I'm from Austin and it's been the weirdest like thing in, in in my life lately has been like this kind of like right-wing fascination with the city of austin right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um you know and all of these kind of reactionary because look alex Didn't jones ben is a big ba- no he went to nashville thank no, god Rogan even still there, even still probably, he's yeah. out there alex wearing jones. his stetson yeah yeah um, and his Amazing. like six inch cowboy um you know so he can get into his gmc tonali but uh, um <laughs> with an unscratched bed but but it's funny because I, I I've seen I've seen because um, like look Alex Jones like is an interesting character I think that like for better for worse like I can actually see Alex Jones in like the constellation of like Austin right just like sort of way out there kooky stuff a little bit anti-war you know he got he got crazier as t- I used to watch Alex Jones as a kid on like public TV that's why it turned oh. out so great um, but because uh, he was on public he access does. TV yeah, yeah. here you know, I didn't know that. He, oh, well, he yeah. was also he was also marketing himself in a very different way like, absolutely he made a yeah. huge basically until the obama presidency like like if you watch like uh waking life or scanner darkly like yeah, like yeah. those he has these little cameos doing doing his like yeah he's like ranting but like the stuff he's ranting is like stuff that like if you're a kind of you know vaguely hippie-ish austin leftist you could like nod yeah. along to you know that like uh mm-hmm. it's it's like the the tone is very alex jonesy but it's like it's like i don't know the government is really bad and corporations are really bad and they lied like, to okay. you about 9 11 or they yeah, lied about yeah. war in Iraq. There were no weapons of mass destruction. Totally. So th- these yeah. are on ramps. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Man, yeah. War in I, Iraq. I, so responsible for all this shit, too. <laughs> but it, totally. the thing is, like, yeah, it, I, but... I mean, I mean, in multiple ways, very responsible for it, right? Like, because because yeah. on, on the mm-hmm. one hand, like, they did, um, you know, was just watching parts of the uh, debate between Scott Horn and, and, and William Crystal, and, and and like, you know, neither of these guys are people's politics I agree with, but like. Uh, but one of the best points Horn made is that like people like Crystal who became like very, you know, who are like the ultimate sort of polite never Trump Republicans now, like they spent all the 2000s whipping up like the worst right wing demagogues you could possibly imagine yeah. with mm-hmm. like anti-Muslim paranoia and stuff like that. <laughs> Completely. And then it's like now it's no longer politically convenient for them, you know, so so they want to disown it, you know, but it's like, no, you, you could never have had, you know, like all of this, any of this. You know, with without the way that was was stoked in the Bush era, not to mention, of course, that like, but it also like benefits from people being disillusioned with everything that happened in the Bush era. Like Rush Limbaugh, mm. toward the end of his life, there are clips where he says things like, uh, "The deep state tricked Bush into invading mm-hmm. Iraq." Mm-hmm. <laughs> Amazing, yeah. You know, wow. Well, yeah. I, I just wanted to... that the whole time. <laughs> uh, uh, missed opportunity. Well, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up for today. Wait, um, wait, 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 wait. Think... Oh, wait. Before oh, we go, I'm oh. so sorry. I have one oh, okay. last thing to share with you all. Which oh, is that's that... right. Yeah, I forgot about your surprise. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, this is the most embarrassing thing about James Lindsay as, like, as a whole. Okay? And it's extremely hard even to talk about and to share with you. I'm going to feel very bad saying some of the sentences I'm about to say. Which is that on Twitter, if you pay attention, you'll notice that James Lindsay likes his favorite joke is uh, your mom jokes. Okay. Mm. Oh, yeah. Because he's 12 years old. Loves somehow. it. Yeah. You're so, right. I've got a couple of those. I've got I'm a getting couple rolled of these. by this guy. So, okay. You, we all remember last week or a week, two weeks ago, maybe he went on the Dr. Phil show and uh, was wild, wildly said as many bananas things as he possibly could in his like minute and a half of screen time which was oh well, chef's kiss i loved it i had a great we all had a great time someone on twitter criticized this appearance and said quote speaking in sound bites is a hard skill to master less is more make one or two points clearly he tried to jam in too many which james Lindsay retweeted with the following comment you should see how much i can jam into your mom <laughs> jesus okay? christ Oh my God! Someone says to well, James, Doc, yeah. just, just 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 as a reminder, this is a guy who once co-wrote a book called Impossible Conversations about how you should be able to like have a dialogue about anything. <laughs> how much you disagree with 
<laughs> Never forget. <laughs> I have a, a bunch of these. I'm going to just share some highlights. November 30th, 2021, someone says to James, you still don't know what communism even is. James replies, it's when your mom does the whole neighborhood. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. On this Thanksgiving day, he said last year, I'd like to take a moment to say how grateful I am for your mom. <laughs> what? I like, yeah. I mean, imagine the damage that wokeness would do. I mean, that's the stuff that, this is the stuff that's going to save us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Messiah um, is here. Doesn't look like what we thought he would, though. No. The, yeah. <laughs> so he says a couple of months ago, the woke are not mere communists. They're Nazis. Literally. Oh, I understand oh, right. I it now. Nazis 2.0. Okay? So oh, yeah. Rob Russo replies, that's crazy, dude. <laughs> <laughs> James Lindsay says, I wish. Rob replies, you should go hide in a bunker or something to protect yourself. This sounds really scary. <laughs> Lindsay replies, I'm a fighter, but if I need a bunker... I have a standing invitation from your mom. Oh. Well, he is a fighter, though. Have you seen his axe dancing and his sword dancing? Oh, the sword dance. The sword, sword play. Sword yeah. Thing. This is a man who's sword. ready for I the mean... coming horde. <laughs> one, one, one last your mom joke from James Lindsay, which, again, this is the most embarrassing fucking shit I can actually imagine. I can't fathom. Saying this shit in earnest, it's bananas to me. Okay, also, tell me what this means. The initial tweet that starts off this thread is, Twitter is Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, but for journalism. <laughs> That's awesome. I like how that one tickled David. He was like... Can what? anyone explain to me what that, that means? That one, that one got me, too. Just like, <laughs> it's so stupid. Because so this whole thing is he just, like, combines stuff, right? Like, he's just yeah, like a little kid. He it's just grabbing yeah. words and he's combining them. He's like, look, I, I, I figured it out. That's he's what like, he does with job. the, like, postmodern neo-Marxism yeah. stuff, too. He'll be like, oh, and Marcuse and then Twitter's Angela just, Davis. like, Derrida for journalists. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. It's out. He said the Twitter... No, no. He said Twitter is deconstruction. It's, like, actual... Der it's Derrida's deconstruction, like... <laughs> I, like happening as an operation. That's Incredible. I mean, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, maybe. I don't know. It's maybe, all, I mean, like, yeah, this is the one out of a million shot who maybe got that one right. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. I'm with so, him on that. <laughs> so, okay. I don't know what this means, but he says Twitter is Upton okay. Sinclair's The Jungle, but for journalism. Someone replies, I don't think you understood The Jungle. <laughs> <laughs> to which James Lindsay replies, Okay, story time. Your mom and I were at a party. And she was a little <laughs> tipsy and a lot of handsy. I get it. I mean, dot, 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 smug emoji. But I digress. We snuck off. At a climactic moment in time, I said, welcome to the jungle. She sang GNR songs all the rest of the night. She's still humming them now. <laughs> Is it Guns uh, and Roses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't imagine a romantic night with that guy. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! No, there's, there's, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, oh, have you seen him in his videos? He has a very difficult time, like, keeping his face still. He's constantly retreating into his neck <laughs> like a little so turtle. True. Yeah, <laughs> so true. It's like Alfie <laughs> Bong is like queering the kids and like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there it is. That's my set of the most embarrassing fucking thing I can possibly. That was the most elaborate so your mom joke I've ever like. It's, yeah, that's like, too long, bro. Really I thought the point of a your mom joke is it was supposed to be pithy, like on the spot. Your, your mom, like yeah, yeah. turned it into yeah, right. a knock knock. Joke. I, I, I mean, oh, yeah. pres presumably a your mom joke is funny because of like the shock, value, like like just the like it comes at you by surprise, right? Or else yeah. it's not that funny, right? Like. Yeah. You, you can't do the your mom joke and then do like three more sentences of well, like, yeah, oh, you... then she was humming guns and roses. No, you can't like, <laughs> you can't, like construct That's your the elaborate bit of the flex, you, you can't too. construct Just... your elaborate fantasy for what you would be doing with like the hypothetical of your mom <laughs> and have it still kind of come off in the same way. You know what I mean? Like, it's not well, yeah, and, then, it. and then me and your mom were here and then we were like, you know. No, Owen, <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Why is that? Why is that um, <laughs> not a good closure to Owen the joke? Owen is a connoisseur <laughs> of your mom joke. He knows what he's talking about. Okay. I, I mean, because because this because like that might as well have been 
and then you know me and your mom dated for about six months but it just didn't work out and we kind of drifted apart <laughs> it just turned into a country song it turned out that we had different visions for where we were going in life yeah 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 we're still kind of we're still kind of we're still kind of friends she's you know you know sometimes things don't work out you leave yeah. me on red. <laughs> complete, Shout out to Guns N' Roses, though. Complete dipshit. <laughs> Dog-brained idiot. I hate him with a lot of pa- passion. I despise James Lindsay. You've, we're up you've, done, you've done the research, and the research hurt you, dude. I it, I, I I'm, I'm not kidding you guys. I shared with you, I think, four or five. I have a document with dozens. Oh, Lord. He does oh, your mom Lord. jokes every day of his life. It is stunning yeah i don't know what's more painful reading that stuff or doing what i tried to do a little bit before this which was to you know distill to try to distill from their like writing some basic philosophical claims this is extreme this induces brain worms and it's really 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 it's massive hard. psychic we're, damage yeah we're all the worst for it yeah all right well maybe we should wrap up there was there another clip that you wanted to show or another tweet that you wanted to share Gil, we good? no i think that that's enough for me so okay so... well I, I, I do feel like it's a little bit of a shame that we did the whole beef thing, but maybe you guys have all heard this before. I, I, I know David has, but the, <laughs> okay. uh, the thing, uh, you know, we did do the, the Russ and Brigley story about this. So, oh, uh, go right okay, ahead. So, so okay. Right. So, so We're Fred Russ was, uh, was, uh, he was like at the Zizek Peterson debate in, in 2019, you know, he, he was like driving Slavoy around and, you know, and, and, and like, coordinated stuff for him and everything and so they they did a dinner before the debate you know with with uh, the the Slavoj and russ and and like the peterson family and like probably some other people and um in the car the way over russ was like filling in Slavoj about who all these people were and like you know trying to give him a little quick guide and started talking about uh peterson's daughter michaela and uh and and he and he mentioned those bizarre tweets back and forth between peterson you know jordan peterson michaela peterson about the the all beef diet and you know the mm-hmm. uh which like extremely bizarre like she tweeted <laughs> at her dad a picture of her in a bikini and said like looks like the you know looks like the all beef diet isn't as unhealthy as they said so like normal that. guys so yeah, normal. very yeah. very normal <laughs> super, stuff super normal uh, nothing family. to comment on here but the uh, like he <laughs> he said so so he tells he tells you to call stuff in the car and then like they get there and and um and there's uh, and everybody's being introduced to everybody, and and Slavoj is introduced to Michaela, and in a very you know Zizeki way, it's very easy to imagine, just just bursts out with Ah yes, the beef girl. <laughs> and, <you know>. <laughs> 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 Slavoj, you're a real one. He's so real. He dude. Is, <laughs> he is. Is precisely pure ideology to eat only beef. <laughs> you are pure ideology. <laughs> he's the best that rocks there are the two thinkers one. that you can't escape doing impressions of and it's jordan peterson and zizek it's inevitable yeah. <laughs> they're so good yeah. i love them um, all right okay so should we wrap up yeah let's call it <laughs> all right well i mean i just really want to thank both david griscom and ben burgess thank you guys so much uh for coming out you can check out david's uh work at left reckoning and ben's at give them an argument <laughs> And uh, of course, you can check us out at Left of Phil on Twitter um, and find our Left of What's Left of Philosophy podcast wherever you get them. Thanks a ton for joining us.